worn out, and tired, you know. Things are tiring. The world is a tiring place. Oh, look, he's back. Okay. All right. So I've been, I've been reading this book. It's a short book with the worst cover and the worst name of any education book that I've ever read. So oddly enough, it's, it's not really a pedagogy book. It's a book about changing people's minds on education reform. But that is such a boring angle for a general audience that I think we're just going to take it in the other direction and just say like, hey, what are, what are the metaphors and prototypes that influence the way that we think about education? The first thing that we're going to do, hopefully Chris has his uh, paper, he's got something to draw with, or uh, is going to do the digital equivalent. I thought we would just start by, before we get into schools, which one do you want to do? You want to do birds or homes? A uh, home. A home? Oh, okay. That's kind of the most boring one, but okay. So let's just take uh, a minute or two and let's each draw a picture of a home. It's like what the house emoji it looks like on if you go to the emoji keyboard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what? Yours looks exactly like if uh, I drew my house in, um, in like Photoshop or whatever. So yeah, wow, the, the platonic ideal of a of a suburban house, right? Is kind right. of what Chris and I both ended up pulling up here. Do you just want to describe yours for just a minute, Chris? What what kind of went into the creation of yours? What what wells of experience and knowledge and understanding were you using to to guide your what you ended up creating for your yeah, one second. I'm just putting my finishing touches on it. Oh, okay. Wait for this bar to fill up here. All right. So in my drawing, what I was going <laughs> uh so <laughs> uh like this it looks like the house I guess I grew up in. It's like all the houses around me. You have the the fenced in yard. I don't need the white picket Americana fence, but you know, it's nice to have a fenced in yard. I have a dog, so it's an ideal house for me. It's got nice big trees. Um, two store I'm a big fan of two story houses. I just like I like I like looming over others from the top window. Uh you know, it's got it, it doesn't need a lot of landscaping, like really simple to maintain, nice big windows, like natural light. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a house. Okay. I, I nice. would prefer my house looks a little nicer than this drawing of my house using my laptop mouse, but the, the general vibe is there. You know, a lot of mine was influenced by by similar things, right? Kind of just growing up in um, the suburban Midwest, uh, you know, you got the chain link fence, you got the the pretty simplified landscaping, got the garage on the side there, um, you know, um, kind of connecting into the streets and side. Very, very like automobile focused. Uh, this could mm -hmm. just as be basically be like the Simpsons house in Springfield, right? It's just yeah. the, the, it's the most bare bones thing. But of course, that's influenced by our fairly typical white bread Americana <laughs> experience yeah. of Midwestern American life. Most of both of neither of us are coastal people. Um, and yeah. yeah, we kind of grew up in middle class white families uh, at a time where there was a lot of prosperity for those kinds of families in the in the 90s. Let's Go ahead and turn, uh, well, turn your paper over, Chris. Turn your digital paper over. Okay. And let's go ahead and draw a school. Now, is this an ideal classroom or just a classroom? This is just go with your gut. I will say this is going to be much harder for me. All right. Mine's beautiful. Okay. And it's fun because I get to click over on the... Okay. All right. Do you want to start again just for the, the sake of the formula here? What are we looking at? Yeah, this would be a realistic interpretation of my ideal classroom it wouldn't be okay. my ideal classroom but it, i think it, it so when i taught um i taught at least in my my final year's teaching i taught in a computer lab and people were in groups like this at these like table groupings so they were desktop computers so they were kind of all centrally located um that was kind of all i had <laughs> in an ideal scenario i think it'd be really cool to have a classroom where people sat at tables there's a lot of natural lighting these are supposed to be natural lights so not fluorescent like top down yeah. lights. These are like those standing yeah. lights, maybe some flexible furniture, like this little rug here with like some like those like beanbag chairs that have the armrests on them. Like um, it. I didn't even attempt to do, but like an egg chair or like a couch or something like that'd be really cool. Yeah. Um, and these in the background, these are TVs. Um, I think there's still a space in a room to have like a projector or something where everyone can look at the same thing, but I would prefer to yeah. have TVs around the room so then they can have dual purpose. Because then, like the groups could use them, we could all see it easier. There's a lot of just, a lot of different applications for having just multiple screens. Yeah, what's really interesting is I think yours is a lot more probably prototypical of 
I don't know, like an average elementary school classroom. A lot of elementary yeah. classes, yeah, yeah. pre-K are really, you know, constructed like this. But I think this might be a fairly radical setup for as you get into maybe you make the middle school shift, you know, from elementary to middle and then into high school. And you start to perhaps see what I what I ended up coming up with here, which is, again, like in the in the prototypical sense, this certainly describes my uh, classroom experience um, as a as a kid growing up. Now, maybe in some classes, like a science class, we were potted up, you know, and there were more hands on things or more collaborative kind of like lab work. Um, but I, I would say like this pretty much defined my, um, again, suburban Iowa school experience. What's interesting that now that you're saying that is that so, you know, growing up in my suburban uh, school setting, this probably was pretty indicative of what a class may look like, maybe not all the TVs and stuff, but in terms of the, the table and chair setup, but the delivery model was primarily the same as what you have on your image. So even though we sat with these more flexible seating patterns and we sat in groups, it was still a lecture in front of the room. We were just seated differently. I love it. Sit and get with flexible seating. <laughs> in the book, Dumb Ideas Won't Create Smart Kids, they actually challenge the reader to this task as well. And then they counter by asking like, hey, does your picture look like either of these? The one on the left is a photo of the earliest known example of school circa 2000 BC. <laughs> and the one on the right is Miss Logan in, it's at Miami University here in Ohio, um, a normal college model school classroom, uh, 1911, two, three, almost 4,000 years in between. Both of these images really predate at any of our modern understanding of psychology, pedagogy, neuroscience, neurobiology, sociology, cognitive science linguistics, learning and curriculum design, assessment, disability, neurodivergence, education policy, all of that, which really is a product of the 20th and the 21st century. Think about how little we knew about the brain and how it worked 100 years ago. And now we have fMRI machines and scans, right? For us, I think as educators, um, really connects to this concept, the concept of schema, Right. So a schema for us as educators is something that you kind of learn. I don't know, child development 101. It was for me, which is just basically, hey, here's a topic. Here's this framework, this schema of all the related concepts, everything, you know, the relationships between ideas and concepts. And here's one that I just drew up real quick for like school. All right. So at its most basic level for me, OK, school is cognitive. It happens in the brain. Here's all the related things. It's social, so we got to take these things into consideration. It's cultural, it's economic. Of course, there's this isn't the whole entire thing, but it at least got me thinking, right, about here's all the stuff that I associate with school that's represented here in this, what, what, what George Lakoff and the authors of this book call your prototype. So if you click on the next one, Chris, we'll see what that one is. Nice. So in that prototype of school, rests uh it's a representation um our, our brains organize that schema by creating these prototypes a representation of the category of the schema that turns right this con uh, these abstract concepts into a concrete thing called school so whether the outside looks like that or the inside looks like the models that chris and i um, have talked about here and of course there are other schema if you want to look at the next one chris Nice. Oh, we didn't do birds. You can close out of that. <laughs> that would be out of context. <laughs> right? Chris and I's schema for homes does include these things, right? We are aware of other types of housing, aren't we? Like we know that other people in other societies and civilizations throughout time have lived in other types of housing. But our schema, our prototype rather, of the prototypical American home is based on the schema that we've built up through our experiences. Okay. Um, so it doesn't look like, um, uh, you know, I don't know, um, in uh, Latin America, you know, or uh, uh, other kind of indigenous uh, influences in Central and, and South America, perhaps in the American Southwest, or, you know, on the African savanna, right, where you're not going to have access to the same kinds of building materials, and you have different needs for the people that live within them, or in you know, tsunami zones in Southeast and uh, Southwest Asia, um, where you're going to need to be more responsive to those elements, you know, so we know that these things exist, but our prototype represents the schemas that Chris and I have as, you know, Midwestern suburban white dudes. What's the next thing that we got on here? 
Cool. So that's the same thing for our schema of school. We have a bunch of different um, notions of what school could be. And I just searched on Google images for school. And the ones on the left there are literally the first three results. <laughs> it's like the clip art um, mm -hmm. example for school, both in you know reality with the clip art, um, or I guess in the clip art, sorry, and then in reality with that second image. And then the third one is literally the inside picture um, uh, that, that I had drawn on my side over here. But Chris, we also know, you and I, that different types of school exist. Montessori schools exist that look dramatically different from, uh, you know, the models that you and I are, are uh, we were familiar with when we came up in traditional suburban schools and even outdoor classrooms too. So why do we think of school or education as having to happen within, you know, these particular four walls and these desks in rows? There's a lot of valid, legitimate learning that happens outside of those walls too. So what are the metaphors influencing the construction of our prototypes of school? So yeah, and I included this clip from The Mandalorian. We, we'll get to it here, I think. No, let's just go ahead and watch it. But I included this clip of The Mandalorian to even see how for the showrunners, for the you know, script writers, et cetera, for this show that takes place. Oh, well, maybe I, maybe I fudged myself again here. Because doesn't, doesn't Star Wars take place in a long time a ago long in a galaxy? Time ago. So technically, oh, shoot. it predates the Assyrian Empire. Shoot. Um, but I think... From a pop culture standpoint, when we think about Star Wars, it is still an advanced civilization. So yeah, even though yeah. it is not futuristic, technically, the software and technology that is being employed is futuristic by our regard. Yeah. I mean, the point that you're getting at, though, is that the, the interpretation of school as classroom in rows is transcending solely Hey, our ability to understand what's what school is in the present, but also being able to imagine what school could be in the future. So even though, again, Star Wars, I mean, giant asterisk is technically in the past <laughs> from a science fiction perspective, it is quite silly that they have this advanced civilization with like all of this technology and they're literally flying through space and, and you know, are visiting all these planets, but yet school still looks like school. Just like how we have it today, it's, it's school. It's the exact same. They yeah. even have tablets that they're learning on to make it more individualized. Yes, you're right. Like call it the factory model, big scare quotes there, transmission model, the traditional model, the mechanical model, the banking model, Paulo Freire um, coined that term there too. So it relies on the conduit metaphor for learning, where we understand the brain and the mind as an empty vessel. Right, that's the metaphor that fits for not just these imagined futures in Star Wars or the prototypes that Chris and I came up with, but also like just the past, how these things were organized. So if we understand the brain to be an empty vessel, then learning is a conduit, right? Learning essentially is placing ideas in that empty vessel. Where I wanna jump into this is that Something that's been fascinating to me as you've been talking about this content, and we've had a little yes. bit of disagreement off the air on whether or not to bring up Saussure or not, because quite literally what you're describing is Saucer. Like th this, this is the concept of like structuralism, post-structuralism, um, semiotics, these, these really advanced, I, I don't even call them advanced concepts, like foundational concepts to linguistics um, and to an extent philosophy. My goal, as you've been talking about this entire video, is really just to convince you that those things matter in this narrative in terms of how we're talking about school, how we talk about school with kids, et cetera. Right. Does that make sense? Are you going to talk about that? Or can, yeah, I'm trying to make interactive. I, I'm, I'm waiting for your response. <laughs> uh, how do you record? How, how do you do video content? How is that done? I just think we can, we can access those through simpler ways without an appeal to French authority, um, we can demonstrate and we can see the impact that these actually have um, without necessarily connecting them to a framework that maybe makes, makes it more complicated and less likely for communication to be effective. I, I would make the argument that that claim would imply that you should teach people how to do experiential learning without talking about John Dewey or that we should understand the fundamental ideas of having a democratic discussion about society without ever bringing up Paulo Ferreira. It's like, 
at, at what point does theory matter in the conversation about making change in the real world? You know what I'm saying? So like, how I do think we... it's like a tier. I think it's like a tier two thing. Cause I think first step one is saying like, Oh, see how this could be important and see how these ideas could be valid. And then you connect it to frameworks. Cause then you're like, Oh, this is exactly what, George Lakoff was talking about, or this is exactly what Frere Maybe, was talking about. But I would about. argue this that the way that you're different. interpreting this book is already in in the second frame. <laughs> like, let, let me explain really quick okay. what what these concepts are, and maybe we'll have uh, that that moment where we come together after we're there. Maybe people will learn if they don't. So let's first start with structuralism. Do you know what structuralism is, Nick? No. <laughs> so really simply. Uh, describe to me what are key features of a science fiction movie? Uh, space, uh, technology, um, aliens, stuff like that. Yeah, that is structuralism. <laughs> structuralism, oh, okay. which could be applied to a variety of different things. W one thing that we can understand structuralism through is genre. The idea that there are these various structures or foundations that are a part of our culture. So when you and I are talking about something like science fiction, we both kind of know what that is. We've as we a on society. Yeah, yeah, we have as a society have developed those terms, right? Like science right. fiction didn't predate human understanding and knowledge. We right. have science fiction is not a timeless concept, right? It, it's, yes. a, it's a socially constructed thing that you and I happen to agree on. But and there's also even sub genres of science fiction that people also disagree like the space opera versus the time travel movie versus the climate fiction now you know climate as a, fiction, as whatever as it might be it yeah. doesn't matter that ostensibly is structuralism it's the idea that we've developed these ideas situated in these like foundations of, of culture and understanding which is a, a major literally what Saussure uh came up with in the late 19th century all of that to say, one element of structuralism and probably Saucer's most famous concept is this idea of the signified versus the signifier. So the signifier is a literal thing. So imagine that we're walking outside and we see this tree. This is not a drawing of a tree. Like we quite literally are outside and looking at a tree, right? Right. That's the signifier. The signified is the way that we understand what that thing is. The signified is the literal tree. It's the guttural sound from our, our mouth that is the word tree. That's why it's in quotes, tree. Yes. So if I say the word tree to you, Nick, what does that signify to you? What is the signifier? The plant that can grow, but is generally like, hard and barky um it can grow really big and tall sustain its own ecosystems um yeah it can have pine cones or fruits you know like if you have an apple tree or all these different things so i don't know something and like just, that yeah right and just like when we did the activity surrounding school our interpretation of a tree is very much based around our own cultural context right our idea of trees in North America is very different than, let's say, in Japan, where you might automatically think about like a cherry blossom tree as your first sure. thing. I, I don't think of a cherry blossom tree when I hear the word tree. I associate that with an entirely different category, right? A cherry yep. blossom tree is like its own thing, whereas trees are like pine cone trees or fruit trees or whatever those things might be. As distinct from other plants, too, right? Because there is a right. definition of tree that could be so broad that it could include all types of plants that would then have to be, it would necessarily be incorrect because it's too broad. You got to narrow it down a little bit. That's very interesting because like Saucer's whole thing was coming to the realization that the way that which we describe things is based around the way that we don't describe other things. But oh. that's, that's beyond the scope of this conversation. Um, in terms of signified versus signifier, though, the reason why this matters is so far we've been only talking about the physical way at which we see a tree, right? The, the way that we literally depict a tree in our head when we, heard, when we hear the word tree. But there's also an emotional element to this as well that's associated with that, right? For example, when I think of cherry blossom tree, 
I think that's like a really beautiful thing. When I think of a typical tree in, in my North American view, I think of like maybe shelter or like shade. So there's yeah, an association yeah. that's more emotional with the concept. In the same way, if we go back to our uh, pictures of school, it's not just that we're thinking about these concepts as physical space. We are when we imagine a classroom, but we're also imagining them as an emotional space. The way right. at which, you know, when you were talking about your like Iowan growing up version of school, what emotionally do you connect that with? Not, not very positive. <laughs> I'm boring. Right. Uh, yeah. Stuff like exactly. That. You associate with kind of a negative connotation, right? There's, yeah. a, there's an emotional there. connection there as well. So what Saussure was basically saying was that, yeah, there are these literal things that exist, and we have literal words that we've attached to those things, but how you feel and interpret that thing. And structuralism is attached to that by sense of, we are able to thematically group these things together and therefore we have made meaning out of it and we have our own personal meaning ascribed to that concept, right? right. And, and like, for example, a way might be we've grouped a certain group of subjects together to mean mathematics. Mathematics has a genre around it. And as a person, I could be a quote unquote math person or not be a quote unquote math person because right. of how it makes me feel over time. Well, weren't we just right. having this conversation with Howard Blumenthal last week where he was like, the social studies doesn't exist anywhere else outside of school. It's not a real right. thing. <laughs> right, exactly. Now, pulling this one step further over time, Saussure, Saussure's theories went to a variety of different spaces, but because I have to bring it up in like every single video, um, it also gave way to post-structuralism, which this is where it starts getting really weird and you're probably going to want me to edit it out, but it, it does make sense for what we're talking about when it gets to that Mandalorian video. Wow. Okay. I, you had me with Mandalorian. I'm back. Okay. So All right. th this is where we get into like AI and science fiction futures and understanding like the world today. So, okay. I'm in, I'm in. So Saucer basically said that we understand, for example, the genre of science fiction because there are a bunch of science fiction films and people create things in that science fiction category. And although like, there are people that deviate from the norm, we're able to recognize what the deviation is. So for example, if the twist of the movie is that it was all a dream, for example, that's a trope that occurs in a lot of different like science fiction films or, or like films that do like a lot of psychological horror type stuff. If a right. film doesn't do that, then sometimes we're like, oh, that's really breaking from the norm. But we still understand that conceptually. You know what I mean? Like that's a thing. Heroes and anti-heroes kind of thing. It's like the anti-hero is sort of a subversion of just like the normal, normal hero's journey that maybe has us as readers identifying and cheering someone for whom in a traditional context would be a villain or the bad guy kind of. So then that pulls us into now the 20th century and my, my man, Jean Baudrillard, <laughs> um, who did a lot of stuff surrounding post-structuralism. In post-structuralism, we're shifting our understanding of that, which the, the, the general gist of this is, is that there are multiple different truths and meanings of anything based around the person who's interpreting that concept. So it's not that there's a universal truth that this is what science fiction is. It's that every single person who interacts with science fiction is going to have a different interpretation of that thing. And the only reason why that thing feels like it's a universal truth is that we've made it so. <laughs> Does that make sense? I mean, it's, it's the... It's kind of like the comic book guy, again, to bring up The Simpsons, right? Ar the, uh, uh, nerd fandoms and cultures just sort of argue in, in, incessantly about uh, these, these uh, different overlaps between subgenres and sub subgenres and how each of these kind of the obsession with uh, these categories of things, not realizing perhaps that they're participating in the construction of those labels while they are also nitpicking them. Yes. Now, where this gets really crazy, and the thing that interests me about the Mandalorian concept, is that Baudrillard believed that 
we have moved to a point, if I go back to the Saucerian model, he examined the Saucerian model. And he basically said that there was no such thing anymore as the signified, that the signified was basically being constructed for us. And at this point, really all we had was the signifier. Imagine that you're watching uh, uh, a sitcom, like the Brady Bunch or something, right? Family, uh, kind of a comedic situation, situational comedy. It's what it's in the name. <laughs> right. A, a it's, family it's, situational yeah. comedy. That's how I would understand it. Wholesome. Right. And how's that family constructed? How do they interact? Oh, uh, I mean, dad is kind of a lumbering goofball. Mom's taking care of the family. Uh, the kids are, uh, the girls are off dating and chasing boys and cheerleading. And the guys are, you know, doing traditionally masculine coded activities and, you know, hijinks ensues. I don't know. Right. And that's like a whole genre, right? There, there right. is a whole thing of different, uh, different sitcoms that all follow those same tropes based off of this idea of a modern sitcom. What Baudrillard argued in terms of post-structuralism is that the signifier doesn't exist because the sitcom isn't based off a real family. Like it's not like oh, reality right. television. And even then it's, that's arguable because a lot of that stuff is scripted. But like we're not right. actually looking with a camera into someone's actual house and the situations that people go through in a modern sitcom are not realistic, right? People don't live lives like this. They would go, they would go crazy. Okay, so I, I don't know if I'm starting to lose you. It's my last point surrounding this and then we'll, we'll open it up to the Mandalorian thing and this is where I think it gets really cool. Baudrillard believed his fear was that we would begin to judge ourselves based off of the rationale of the signified. So, for example, I would watch a modern sitcom and I would curb the way that I act and behave and represent myself in the real world based off of my interpretation of what I saw inside the modern sitcom. Right. So the modern sitcom never actually existed in real life. But right. me as the viewer, I will watch that and then emulate it in my real life. I'm living what he called a simulacra, a, a simulation of reality so that media has actually overtaken what is real. And I'm just replicating what I see. If we're just talking again about kind of fandoms and, uh, you know, pop culture, that can be one thing entirely. But if we want to bring this back to the conversation about you know, mythologies sure. and school and metaphors and prototypes, well, then it really does matter if people are um, looking at pop culture or reflecting on a mythologized nostalgia of the way school was and now the way, you know, school should be for their kids, forgetting, you know, perhaps their own experience, but filtering it through sitcoms, filtering it through these other lenses, then they're going to start to build education systems and build education policy around that unreality around that simulacra. It, just to briefly toss in one more element to that, that's like the Mark Fisher capitalist realism thing, which is the uh. idea that not only are we stuck in this endless loop of simulated realities based off of what we see and what we receive back, as well as a portion of our lived experience, in this case, going through classrooms, but now that I see, like, for example, in Star Wars, in the, like, this futuristic world, that people also engage in classrooms like this, it becomes more and more difficult for me to escape that as being the thing that it is. In other words, if I build a school that doesn't look like this, there are going to be a lot of people that tell me that's not school because that's not my interpretation of this thing. School has to look like this. This is what school is. This is how I feel in school. Uh, we see this a lot where, like, I don't know if you ran into this when you were teaching, um, but you might get like a parent email that says, you know, my, my kid thinks that school is too active or too fun or you're doing too many hands on things because right. that's not what school is. Right. So things that aren't school coded, if things aren't school co coded, then it therefore cannot be school. So we get right. trapped in this like this inability to explain or talk about ways in which we change our existing reality and instead get hyper obsessed with emulating what someone else is telling us that thing should be. 